Good afternoon, everybody. We're back. Again, let all the peoples pile in. Hope everyone's doing well. I have um, a ray of light from above today. Um, I tried to get it out there, and then I was also like, kind of here for it. I don't know. It's this light. Can't move it. All right. Keep letting people get all in here. Do, do, do. Got all my notes. We have a very exciting guest today. I am personally super um, excited to be able to talk with her. Oh, dear. My ne necklaces are on the step. Got to have a little bling in here. <laughs> Okay, you know what? My hair is looking pretty good. And uh, Sue did, did quite the number on it. It's like pretty good. I'm, I'm, I was impressed. I was very nervous as you guys saw. Okay, I think it's starting to level out quite a bit. So I'm gonna get going here. Um, Again, everybody, welcome to Reset the Table Live. I'm your host, Megan Rapino. This is brought to you by Reink. Um, again, so excited. Uh, it's another Wednesday. Um, you know, unfortunately, it's another Wednesday in, in quarantine and um, in this new world, but it also gives us a chance to do our show again. So um, very thankful for that. Uh, we have a really exciting guest this week. Um, her name is um, Mona Shalabi. Um, she is a writer, a journalist, a presenter, a producer, an artist, an all-around amazing woman. Um, she does a lot of her work in data journalism, which um, is something that I didn't um, even know existed um, until we started to do a little bit of research. Um, she has amazing drawings. She does sort of does this like multi-medium way of presenting news and like giving you information, um, which totally makes sense because why would you sort of only look at things one way if you're only reading or you're only seeing it? Um, you know, we're sort of multi-medium human beings anyway. So I kind of love the idea of presenting things in a way that you're looking at it, you're hearing it, you can see it, you're reading it, you're feeling it, sort of putting all those things together. Um, so really excited to get in and chat with her a little bit more about that. So um, as always, um, Reset the Table is all about gathering, bringing people together, um, you know, having a really cool, interesting conversation, a little bit of construction happening upstairs. So we'll just deal with that. Um, yeah, and bringing people together and asking these sort of you know, provocations on life, um, getting to chat through them and hear other people's perspectives from different parts of the world, different, um, you know, areas of industry, different kinds of people from all different backgrounds. And then really the best thing is being able to take that back out into the world. Um, and hopefully, um, you know, take advantage of our chance to reimagine the status quo, reimagine our world, reimagine sort of what's important to us and go from there. So as always, I am going to try to find our lovely guest and get her in here. Um, okay, no. You know, it's always, always, always okay I gotta get in the area where the people are it's like I need to find a better more efficient way to do, <laughs> to do this I mean as you guys know I literally say this every week um, wait, is it in there? Oh yeah, there we go. Okay. Oh my gosh. Great. I found her. Okay. Um, without further ado, let's get the star in here. Waiting. You're back. Ah, it worked. <laughs> Hi. Hi. How are you? The world. I'm good. 
How are you? Oh, I'm doing, I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Um, I feel like I deserve like a big gold star when I do the technologies, right? So I'm just like, you do. A little, a little pat on the back. How, how are you doing? Thank you so much for, for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. I like the map in your background. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, um, reminding me of the places I can't go, but the places I've been, places I want to go. Yeah. We're kind of trying to get a, get a worldview going on here. But it's not like the standard map. I realize this is completely off the point, but it's not like the standard <laughs> map, right? Like, I feel like it's censored differently. No? Yeah. I don't know what's going on. But no? Okay, never mind. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's... Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm like, okay. background up a little bit. It looks good. Yeah. Um, well, welcome. Welcome to Reset the Table Live. Super excited to have this conversation. I can, sorry, it keeps on cutting up, so I just switched to my Wi-Fi, sorry. There's like a little bit of a delay. I, I'm not sure, I tried switching, switching on my Wi-Fi. It says I'm lagging. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. Hmm. Um, maybe, maybe it is your end. Yeah. No, I'm so sorry. It says laggy, lagging. Yeah. Yeah, let me try maybe to get on. Hmm. There you are. My bath. I see you. you. You look a little bit underwater, but it's a good look. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let's see if for the people in the comments, is it? They're also saying bl blurry, but now you're coming into focus. Okay. It's good. Slowly coming out of it, hopefully. We're going to need the meditation after this, right? <laughs> All right. I'm hearing you a bit better. Make sure you're connected to the mesh, mesh Wi Fi. I'm trying. <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> Got a lot of tech support. <laughs> I think we're okay. Can you hear me okay? I can. Okay, let's, let's, all right. Let's try. We'll, yeah. we'll see. It's, it's, if you don't have a technical failure, you're not even living life right now. It's true. Um, okay, yeah, let's start with a, a little moment to bring us, bring it all back down. If everyone will close their eyes, take a big deep breath. Let it out. Deep breath in and let it out. And we feel each time we breathe in a little bit more calm entering our body and each breath out a little bit of the less calm leaving our body. You can feel your hands maybe on your knees. really cool conversation and to reimagine our world and to breathe some calm back into the world. So take a deep breath in and a deep breath out. Okay. All right. That's probably I the longest I've meditated for in years. I know. Yeah, last week we had um, Deepak Chopra on, and he led he led us in this like insane, amazing meditation. I was like, "Well, 
we're gonna have to just deal with me for the rest of the time. I so. saw it, it was beautiful, but I just watched it without, <laughs> I watched it without closing my eyes or anything. Cause I still, I find it like, it just brings up a lot, right? It's hard <laughs> in its own way to just sit and be still. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's it's like seems like the simplest thing, but it's actually quite hard um, to do. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, so let's get uh, into a little bit. How are you during this time? How are you handling this time? How is it resting on you? Give us a little bit of uh, what's going on in Mona's world right now. Um, I think factually, I am great. You know, if I was to look at the spreadsheet of um, how I'm doing. Um, I'm sure I'm suppressing loads of shit, like way, way deep down. <laughs> um, but I really feel like, um, you know, it's funny, a friend of mine, her, her, her cousin is a nurse for the National Health Service in England. And she said in the nurses room, there's a sign up that just says, this is a marathon, not a sprint, use whichever coping mechanisms have served you in the past. Mm -hmm. And so um, for me, one of my coping mechanisms is to just plunge myself into my work. Mm -hmm. And luckily, it feels like there's a lot of work to be done right now. So, yeah, I just feel like I'm figuring it out through my work, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, I think probably a lot of people figuring sort of some way to um, have that sense of, you know, purpose, I think, throughout the days, yeah. and, um, you know, something to look forward to and something that also feels familiar because, you know, the world is so unfamiliar at this time. And it's like we're not going back to a familiar world either. We're gonna go to something that's, yeah. um, you know, very different, uh, which kind of brings me to my my first question. So I imagine um, the world in so many ways and reimagine, um, you know, how you sort of put that mirror back to us and give us the information you're seeing. How do you reimagine the status quo in your everyday life? Yeah, that's a really good question. I'm also trying not to be too distracted by all of the comments because they're all saying that you look like a potato right now, which is cruel. <laughs> <laughs> it's because you're really blurry. <laughs> oh, um, but, I know. You know, guys, just enjoy the sounds. There are good sounds going on. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so for me, like the status quo is like it's business as usual right and business as usual is really really harmful and it, and it has been for a long time way before all of this happens mm -hmm. um but i think now you know issues like um the fact that so many workers in this country don't have paid sick leave yeah like it's just crystallized so many of those problems that is the status quo in this country it's fine for companies to not give employees sick leave and now there are people for whom if they're sick you know, they're just going to work anyway because it's either yeah. that or, or or have their family go hungry. So I think um, I really hope that my work is trying to challenge the status quo by showing how inefficient so many of the mechanisms are that we have in place and how unjust they are. And again, I think a lot of people knew this stuff before, but um, I don't know. I'm just hoping, I guess, there's going to be a, a more of a motor for change after this is all over, mm -hmm. if it's ever over. Yeah. Do you, do you think like, cause I would, when I look at your work, I'm like, you know, especially the drawings and everything, it really does like hit home, you know, some of these major problems. It's one thing to say like, you know, this group is being, you know, disproportionately affected, but mm -hmm. to like drawn in a picture or to have it so clear in sort of a different medium. I talked about that a little bit. You have like this multi medium way of delivering information how do you process that like what's your process of of going through that and sort of breaking up you know the status quo of just like okay here's my article and i did my research and like here's the words you read them and then imagine out of it what you want well that's great that you say that because that's exactly the goal of the work so that's really good it means that something's going right um and i think it came from like a frustration with the data visualization that i was seeing elsewhere so mm -hmm. like most people think of data visualization they just think of the charts that you can you know bar charts pie charts whatever you want to call it yeah. And I think the problem with those is that very often it doesn't have an emotional resonance, right? And they're almost deliberate about that. It's like, this is pure data. You're not supposed to feel anything. But I think, you know, if it's data about injustice, you should look at it and feel fucking pissed off. You should feel angry. You should feel compelled to, to do something about it. So I, I hand draw stuff and I try to make it more artistic in a way to put that emotional resonance back in. Um, mm -hmm. 
And I also think it's a myth anyway that this notion that data is purely objective anyway. Um, you know, there's all kinds of things that go into the data that's collected from, you know, decisions about what data should be collected and how it should be collected. So I go into it thinking that the information that I'm presenting is inherently biased. Um, but there is still something to be gleaned from that information. There's still some utility in sharing it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's so yeah. interesting how, you know, going to the sort of non-emotional part of data, it's almost, it's like, we know that we're these like multifaceted human beings. We have emotions, we have hearts, we have bias, yeah. we have, you know, um, eyes and ears and a mouth. And like, you know, then we have a brain and we have a heart, all these things in the heart in the literal sense and in the figurative sense. And it's like, it's so funny to me that we just then think like, oh, we don't want to be emotional about it, or oh, we don't want it. We just give it yeah. as bleak as you can. It's like, that's not, that's not reality. And that's not yeah. how people understand things in the best way anyways. They, they, they might read something, but then they're having a feeling about it, or they're having yeah. a thought about it, or in, in some sort of um, way. Do you, so can you actually, to back up, can you explain yeah. journalism a little bit and like, is that sort of, you know, the future of where we're going more so or multimedia kind of what you do or what's what's your view on that? Yeah, I, I just want to go back to something you were saying earlier about how like we we feel like inherently the world is more complicated than that. And mm -hmm. I think you're absolutely right. Like humans are more messy than that. And I think people's gut instinct about that actually fosters like a distrust in a lot of the statistics that they're hearing, right? Like you hear 32% of Americans think this and you're just like, really? Do 32% of Americans think yeah. that? And I think very often people are then left with a choice of like, either this comes from the New York Times and I trust that source so I'll accept it, or it comes from this other source and I think they're bullshit so I won't accept it. And we have to find like a better way to navigate ourselves through and ask questions to, to get at the truth. Um, and to answer your question about data journalism, um, I would say that data journalism has been around for as long as journalism has. Like, there were always efforts to collect numbers as part of storytelling uh, and to communicate them. Um, I think it has become like more... I, I, oh God, this is a bad expression. I was gonna say like, I feel like more and more people are getting boners for data journalism. Uh, people are like really, really excited about it. And yeah. I find it a little bit worrying sometimes, even though it's great for me and I'm so lucky that I still have work right now and that it's a good time for what I do. Um, but I feel like one of the risks of it, right, is that it almost erases the power of individual experience and it erases the importance of anecdotes. So if you, if mm. you tell me my experience going into a store was this i felt like i experienced this discrimination or, or whatever it is and i'm like well actually the data says you didn't the data says that's unlikely i, I don't want that to discredit your own experience of the world like mm -hmm. the two have to complement each other a little bit better so yeah i think data journalism is good um i don't think it can be the only way of telling stories right yeah i mean that yeah. that totally makes sense that has to it's like you know we're multifaceted multiple things can be true at at one time you sort of want to get um, the whole picture. Um, yeah. who do you feel like in, in this moment, maybe in your own life or someone in the, in the culture or whatever is, is really doing a good job of like redefining either themselves or their work or sort of redefining a current system mm -hmm. to mirror what's happening in the times. And like, who do you feel like is doing a really good job of that? Might just. Um, this is my view. No, 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 I'm definitely not going to say me. Um, I, I'm going to say, literally, I was listening to it just before I jumped on the, on the Instagram live. I was um, listening to Ear Hustle. Do you ever listen to that podcast? Mm. No, it's, um, it's a podcast that initially was set up by a, by a journalist. I want to say her name's Nigel Paul. Um, and she recorded it inside San Quentin prison with prisoners about life inside prison. Um, mm -hmm. And it, her co-host is a guy called Erlon Woods. And I just think, I feel like the way that um, criminals are dehumanized in society is, is deeply, deeply problematic. And I think he is doing a really good job. I mean, I'm, I'm sure Erlon didn't, isn't redefining himself. He always knew that he was more than a, just a criminal you know i think yeah. he's doing a good job of redefining the public's understanding of um of what that word means yeah mm -hmm. that's such a huge thing about inequality as well as redefining the public's perception of the yeah. margin 
group. Yeah. How do you how do you look at using data journalism or multimedia? I don't even. I feel like I just like made that up, but it's certainly not my own. <laughs> I don't know whatever that you're doing. How do you look at using these sort of multifaceted ways and multimedia ways to combat inequality and then try to break the system? Yeah, I think that's a really good question too. I feel like I just, you just have to keep on repeatedly asking questions, right? Mm -hmm. And that's like kind of exhausting because you hit all of these dead ends. So just another COVID example, because it's like what's always just right here in our minds. Yeah. Um, it's like, you know, we know that um, black Americans are being massively disproportionately affected affected by this um, by this disease, right? So the first the first step of it is people saying, well, rates of asthma, rates of diabetes, there are these conditions which are higher in the black community, therefore, you know, that's why it's higher. And for me, it's like, no, no, let's keep on asking these questions here, because other, unless you keep on asking them, you, it just seems like it's so systemic, it's so all pervasive, well, there's nothing we can do about it, rates of asthma are higher in that community, of course, they're going to get more sick. Yeah. And actually, it's like, no, once you start to unpick, like, let's just look at New York, for example, and let's look at the way that, um, Areas that have had much higher cases of COVID-19 also had much higher rates of poverty. Those neighborhoods also have overcrowding, which increases your likelihood of exposure. Mm -hmm. And let's look at the ways that black communities have historically been in those neighborhoods. And historically, there's all of these systemic structures that keep them in those neighborhoods. Like asthma isn't the end of that answer. You know, it's just the beginning of figuring out what, what is going on here. Yeah. Yeah, and I feel, I feel like you're like, I'm imagining, you know, we can say those things. We can say there's, you know, multiple people living in a house and then, you know, or in, a, in an apartment, and then every room in the apartment and every apartment in the building is like that. And so now I'm imagining sort of like a top down yeah. of all yeah. that at the same time. And then, you know, maybe there's, you know, only one or two parks in that area. So, of course, when the weather gets nice, people want to go to the parks and then they want to exactly. sit out hot because maybe in the building, the air conditioner's broken, you know, and then they're outside on their stoops and maybe they're whatever, not six feet apart. And then the cops are showing up and it's like, there's all these things like you can say them, and write them in. And generally, I start with the data set. I mean, it depends. Sometimes it will be like a question that someone's asking. I'm always checking my DMs for like things that people are asking me that they care about that they want me to cover. Um, and then I'm trying to find the data. And then stories just like jump out from the spreadsheet, you know, like um, there's an example that I, I was telling someone yesterday to someone who was saying how like, the, the, you know, the data feels so raw and so like cold or whatever. And I was I downloaded this incredible data set that was about the way that Americans eat. And it asked thousands of Americans to keep this meticulous food diary for two days. And it's like the best data that we have on nutrition in this country. Really, really fascinating. Before I even started to ask questions about how like nutrition varies by, by income, by neighborhood, by race, by gender, all of these things, I just started to like pick through the spreadsheet and just start to read it and understand what was in it. And I found one row of the data where someone had a glass of milk at 2 p.m. And then they had a, um, a cheese sandwich at 7 p.m. And that's all they ate all day. And immediately you're just like, well, who, like, it's not a row, right? It's a person. Who, who is that person in the spreadsheet? And you start to read it across and it's like Hispanic man, um, immigrant, 67 years old, recently widowed. And you're just like, you just see a person, right? You see, and he, I think he was also a vet. Um, you just see someone who is having to cook for themselves because they live alone. And I don't know, like you start to ask hypotheses. It makes you wonder like, oh, are there other widowers who are struggling to cook for themselves? Like all of these other questions kind of spring forth. So I think I try to come at every spreadsheet as open-minded as possible about what, what I'm going to find in there. Because otherwise, whatever questions you go in with is going to be the stuff that you're going to find. It's kind of like a date, right? Like if you show up to the date with like a bad attitude and being like, this is going to be terrible, it's always going to be bad. 
Um, and I've been on many of those. <laughs> um, um, so you try to come at it with an open mind, but also realistically, I, like I'm my own person, right? I come at it with my own biases. And I'm also trying to be honest about that, about the fact that like, as a woman, as a person of color, that's often where my mind goes in terms of the questions. And someone else might come at it with a different set of questions. Yeah. Mm, so interesting. Yeah, it's, it's like, especially during this COVID, for sure, I feel like the veil has been, you know, pulled back on, on so many yeah. things. The, the empathy part for me, I feel like is really, really lost in all of this. And I think mm -hmm. it can in journalism as well, because you can't see the person going back to the sort of importance of the of the multimedia. Is that what you're trying to convey? Like the that sort of empathy and like the full picture of like, no, this isn't just someone who had a glass mm -hmm. of milk sandwich for the day. Like, this is someone's story. And do you see that, you know, coming out of COVID, you know, eventually, whenever we do that, like, does journalism need to redefine itself in that way and reimagine how we tell stories of empathy or how we create empathy around, you know, the tragic situations that are happening? Hmm. You know, it's really funny. I have such a weird relationship to the word empathy. Like, I know it's supposed to be a good word, but it kind of makes me a little bit uncomfortable for some reason. Like, I assume that empathy means trying to put yourself in someone else's position. And I assume that that's just like really, really difficult. And that for someone who, for example, comes from inherited wealth, who like knows for life, they, they're never going to find themselves in a position of poverty. Hmm. I think that leap is just like, I don't, and I also think that sometimes people think they're being empathetic and then they're making assumptions about other people. Like, I feel like, I don't know, this is me really, really like thinking out loud. So sorry if this is um, very inarticulate. I think I'm quite an angry person. And I think that anger can be good. I think you, like, I literally, again, was just reading just before, um, just before we jumped on the call about um, the fact that Trump is using COVID as an opportunity to deport migrant children without even telling their families. He's doing that currently. And like, that makes me really fucking angry. And it doesn't make me angry from a position of imagining that I'm a migrant child who like, has been stuck in a detention center and is suddenly thrust into a country that I might not even know, you know, um, w with no one. I don't think I can even imagine that experience. It just pisses me off because no child should be treated like that, you know? But maybe anger isn't helpful. I, I don't know. I'm curious, like, do you, yeah. Would you, would you say that anger helps you and what you do? I don't know if it's anger or if it's oh, like it the- cut out. Oh no, am I back? I don't know if it's anger or if it's collective yeah. outrage. Like if you're not mm. out, which, you know, generally if I'm outraged, I'm, I'm not in a pleasant mood. But it's like the collective outrage that we have to have. Like there should be people, you know, obviously we're in COVID, we can't be protesting, but there should be people in the streets, like yeah. because kids are being deported without their parents even being told, because kids are even being kept without their parents. Like yeah. the collective outrage. So yeah, I, I believe in anger for sure. I think that mm. we have a range of human emotions and like some of the things going on in our country or some of the policies that the Trump administration has, or, you know, seeing, the way that COVID has affected, you know, certain communities or seeing the way certain people are treated during COVID and, you know, who's being thought of and who's being taken care of and why do we care so much about the economy when like, we're literally in like a cardiac arrest. Like if we don't save ourselves, we don't have anything to save for the future. So yeah. I think a collective outrage and anger, being upset, being pissed about it and then doing something and then like, what's yeah. the next? Step. I think, you know, obviously anger for anger's sake, um, without doing anything, you know, sort of keeps you feeling kind of, uh, but no, I, yeah. I, I'm with you. And it's like, yeah, it's like, you can possibly understand what that person is going through. And I think that I always think about it. And like, I think there is a need for empathy, but there also is just a need for people to believe each other. Like you were, I think you were saying, yes. yeah. like, if yeah. someone do something about their experience and you're like mm, no i don't really think that happened like you're just yeah. straight up, i'm a liar so now we yeah. talk about her, you know inequality or racial inequality we talk about lgbtq rights talk about whatever it is and like if you're just basically saying a whole subset of people is lying about their collective experience like 
that's where we need to just like, you don't have to know exactly what they're going through, but you exactly. do need to give them at least yeah. the, and maybe, you know, it does get sterilized and it does sort of get um, like put at a distance for people. Mm -hmm. And so, oh, like I, I didn't see that. I don't really know that what's going on. And like, that's sort of why, you know, coming back to your work, why I love it so much. And like, why I think it's so powerful is it like, it puts it in your face. You're like, no, I'm going to show you exactly what I'm talking about. And like, this is, this is someone's experience. Like yeah. I talked to them, they showed me, I see it in my community or whatever it is. So, sorry, I just you're, like rambled no, on. That's, that. that's so helpful. You're absolutely right. And I feel like and if you're part of any minority, it's almost like, it's not even quite being told that you're, you're a liar. It's almost like you're being gaslit, right? Like you go in, you say to someone, I, I don't think I got the job because I just got this look. And like, they said something that was kind of funny as I was going in when I mentioned my partner. And I just, and if they're like, mm, I don't know, what they're doing is they're questioning the world around, like that's what gaslighting is, right? It's saying that the, the world that is around this person actually doesn't exist in the way that they know it to exist. And that's mm -hmm. a really dangerous thing to do, yeah. 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 Also, you just made me think of one specific example of that as well, when you were talking about like, the power of pooling together collective, collective experiences. I remember back in the day before it became super corporate, the founder of OK Cupid is this guy called Christian Ruddle, right? And at heart, he's a data journalist. He's like such a data dude. And he used to publish these blogs. And in one of the blogs before like the HR team were like, Christian, not a good idea. You need to stop publishing these. He was looking at race and dating. And he published these charts that show that he analyzed millions and millions and millions of OK Cupid users. And he said across the board, regardless of sexual orientation, regardless of age, regardless of any of these things, there are two groups that fare really badly. And those are black women and Asian men in America. And it's like, if you don't see that, that data, right? And if you don't see that that data is based on millions of millions of people, and you as a black woman or as an Asian guy are saying, look, I'm having a hard time online. Where else is your head supposed to go in terms of explanations for that? Either you're just like not cute enough, you're not good enough, you're like not, you know, like the power of that data to tell you that your experience is part of a, a collective one, I think can be really, really powerful. Mm, I think so too. We talk a lot um, about, you know, the idea of, you know, reset the table and, um, you know, the idea of inclusion and diversity and having, you know, people at the table. And of course, like, you know, in corporations now and businesses and life, it's like, we need to have everybody, like you can't, you can't be the non-inclusive company, but it's like the whole point of that actually is to get the whole story. If you don't have yeah, everyone- Absolutely. You don't get the whole story. You don't like, you, one person can't possibly have the perspective of everyone. So like, that's the most important thing is to value other people's perspective and know that that's part of reality. You may not know that because mm. you're not yourself, you're not experiencing it yourself, but it doesn't mean that it's not happening. And it doesn't mean that it's not contributing to the overall cultural experience that we're all living in because we all live kind of in this world. Um, exactly. Think, it's, it's not diversity, it's representation. That's what you're striving for is adequate representation. Right, exactly. Yeah. Um, one final question, as we, as we start to, you know, look forward um, into a world that is like so, so vastly different, um, mm -hmm. media been really interesting um news has been really interesting how people i mean we're already in a time where you know the sort of attack on journalism and the attack on intellectualism in the country and the attack on experts mm -hmm. and um a very sort of divided media how do you feel like the news media journalism whether that's you know print media or you know multimedia or whatever how do you think they can redefine themselves to to like hmm. not only be better, but to help us come out of COVID or even just like, how are, how are you thinking about that as, as a journalist and as someone hmm. who, you know, kind of has a responsibility to like help the rest of us, you know, figure out what's, what's really going on in the world. Yeah. It's such a good question. I feel like when you're talking to someone on a one-to-one -one basis, right, you want to understand where they're coming from as they're talking. Mm -hmm. And I almost wish that like journalists made more of a move to to be transparent about that like to just say like this is where i'm coming from as i'm writing this story um and i think this claim that like they are completely impartial and neutral is just sort of dishonest like as i'm coming at the spreadsheet you know 
I'm a lefty. Like, I, yeah. I don't like, I don't like Bezos. I think he makes too much fucking money. I think he should pay his workers. And I'm not gonna like, not say that and then write an article about Amazon, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so I wonder if, it, if that's a part of it. I also think there just has to be more back and forth with the audience. So I'm trying to ask people, what they think I should be writing about before I decide what's important in the morning and kind of go to work. I'm trying to, I run drafts by people. That's kind of some of the joy of like visual um, journalism. I run drafts by people and I say, which of these makes more sense to you? And sometimes mm -hmm. the feedback I get is so valuable and it could be feedback on anything from like the color tones that of the, like the skin tones that I've used in the illustrations to the scale of it, whatever it is. Um, so I think it has to be more, um, inclusive not just in terms of expanding the readership once the piece is out but at every step along the way yeah mm -hmm. i love that something that you said um you know made me think like kind of what we were talking about before we you sort of deliver the news in this very like you know simple way and it gets to you and it's like it's almost like we all try to you know we, it's like we all know we're big like human messes like there's a lot yeah. happening here. Yeah. there's emotions and anxieties and upbringings and whatever that is um, and we kind of need to just like lean into that. It's almost like we spend so much time trying to pretend like we're perfect or like we don't have biases or whatever. And it's like, we all do. So just like, who cares? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I feel like once we kind of shed that, then we can just be like, okay, now we can have this conversation. Like, honestly, now you can write about Amazon and be like, no, I don't like Jeff Bezos. He does make too much money. He doesn't pay taxes. Yeah. He doesn't protect his, yeah. he his worker. He also was like, yeah. was great. And like had a you know a great idea and so like let's have just like the honest conversation and kind of like mm. stop pretending all these things are true when we all know that they aren't so let's just like let's just yeah. get that and then we can sort of go on i feel like yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. i'm oh. not going to get to ask you any of the questions that i wanted to ask i'm so curious about your relationship to data just like as an athlete like how data informs the way that you like view the world mm -hmm. um I mean, a little bit the same to you is that we have, you know, especially it's interesting over the course of my career, there's so much more data now than there was mm. where, you know, GPS and heart rate and all of this. But again, it's like, it's one part of the puzzle. Yeah. So you can tell me, you know, all day, like, you know, I don't cover as much ground as another player or I'm not mm. as bad or I'm better in this or whatever. But it's like, you need to know, you, you, it's like the eye test as well kind of like then you actually look at it and you see who I am as a player and then you yeah. sort of put it together um yeah but, you know much like with anything nothing is is the sort of uh you know the magic bullet for anything you kind of have to put it all together with all of the other information nothing's going you're not going to be able to like you know data your way into a world cup final but like you can use some of the information at least yeah. and use it as a tool but also I think Use it as a tool, but be guided, I think, by your, by your own heart and by your own, mm. your experience and your gut feeling. I think that that's, that's like really important, just kind of with, with everything. But it's also like, we have so much information now. We have so much access to information. Like we would be foolish not to use it and, you know, use as much of it as we can to understand our world better because clearly we don't have all of the problems solved. We have a lot. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Definitely. But Oh, it was so wonderful to be on. Thank you so much. Yeah, no, thank you for having me. And I'm sorry that so many people called you a potato at the start. <laughs> what? Potato with a fire haircut. Like it is it's true. It's true. Yeah. It's the first time I've been a potato online, but like, whatever. <laughs> um, oh, it was so lovely to speak to you. Thank any, you. Like, resources or anything? I mean, obviously you can, um, everybody can, you know, Google and we'll throw up information about you, but is there anything that, you feel like people should be, you know, reading or looking at or anything you want to share with people before we just think about who in your life might want a phone call or a text right now and just mm -hmm. get in touch with them. And then maybe after you've done that, think about who else that you don't know, strangers that might be going through a similar situation. And if you can try to support organizations that help those people. Mm -hmm. Love yeah. that. Love that. So have empathy, but still be angry. Yeah, definitely. They're part of it believe people stop gaslighting people yes yeah yeah it's <laughs> a big thing cool well you stay safe uh, you no know, stay too. healthy continue to do your work it's so important in the world we love uh at re -Ink. we love everything that you're doing continue to reset the table and redefine these conversations it's um really really amazing work that you do thank you so much for having me
Cool. Thank you. We'll see you in Thank real you. life at some point. We'll have to. Uh, Definitely. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.